Welcome to Western Kabuki. Uh, we have crossed the picket line. Um, we've invited Drew Barrymore on to come defend her side of the story. Uh, she and Jimmy Fallon and Ashton Kutcher and Mila Kunis are all here to tell us all about uh, exactly how difficult it is to be them right now. Um, no. Uh, fuck those get. guys. <laughs> it would be nice. It would be very nice, Matt. Thank you for joining us. Matt of uh, The Hard Times. How are we doing, Matt? Pretty good. Uh, hopefully, I can produce similar numbers in uh, listenership. <laughs> See, uh, the thing, the thing probably like, better now than yeah, them. with Drew Barrymore. People would be like, "Oh fuck, this podcast it's over." With their scabs too. <laughs> yeah, no, that would be horrible. That'd be horrible. Do, do y'all want me to do like a really fake apology, like uh, Ashton Kutcher? <laughs> yeah, do you have a from? ukulele? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, that, that apology was weird as hell. Like, that, I don't know. That, everything about that. And, like, Mila Kunis is just, like, posting on Twitter. I thought it was, like, a parody account at first. I don't know if you've seen... I had a visceral where, reaction. I, I had to turn it off, like, a second and a half in just because it seemed so <laughs> weird and off-putting. It was like, ugh. It looked like a... Like an, like a video interview or something like that. It looked like they were yeah. like doing this performance. I think Ashley yeah. Kutcher even like reaches for his heart in the very beginning. He goes, I'm so sorry. I'm like, See, if there's anything we've learned in like 2023, especially is just like, don't, don't do apology videos. Just don't fucking do it. It's, it's always a mistake. Just don't. Do I it. love some apology videos. My girlfriend was going through our smart TV and uh, the, the YouTube had like, 15 minutes into some random apology video and she's like what is this what why were you watching this I was like i just can't help myself a youtuber <laughs> Dude, on I'm the bed on like crying a little bit just being like i'm just so sorry and i don't know any of the context it's good stuff what is I it really with like youtubers would... and celebrities with like having to apologize like i feel like every youtuber in, in this year has to, had to apologize about something what what is with that it's what's going on besides it's because the they're absolute like chats at the babylon b apologizing <laughs> no. <for> nothing they <laughs> they don't bow to the woke mobs um mm-hmm. they sure don't my friend caroline who uh you guys may know as the name that i always show up in on zoom because we're using her zoom account shout out to caroline Big shout, out. Shout, shout out shout out to out caroline, caroline. <laughs> The patron uh, saint she of the makes it possible. <laughs> she works in PR, and every time one of these comes out, she's like, "They could just like continue being rich and not say anything, and like this would blow over." But instead, they feel like <laughs> the need to respond and make it a million times worse. I can't imagine Mila Kunis ever making a movie again after this. Like she fucked it See, up. The problem she whiffed so bad. He, here's the problem: they've never been quote tweeted by like a thousand like teens over fandom uh, like discourse. <laughs> So they don't know how to handle being like dogpiled. They don't know how to do it. They've never they've never dealt with that before. We, we've yeah. had a little we've had a little rule at the hard times and hard drive to never publicly apologize because obviously you tell however many jokes a day. Eventually you're going to step in something. Oh, yeah. um, but I've always felt that a public apology is man, it's asking for it. It's like. <laughs> It, whatever happened, it's going to come back 10 times stronger if you publicly apologize. Just let the joke fade away and die. You know? Yeah, because, yeah. Because nobody wants, they don't want the apology. You know, they want blood. They, they want, want you. Blood. They yeah. want you hurt. Because exactly. they don't, because, because as soon as you apologize for anything, it's like, okay, so you apologize for that, but not this. Mm-hmm. Interesting. I guess we see where your priorities are. You can Basically, do an hour long apology video and they'll be like, he really cut back on some of that stuff. It's, it's really, it's really clear where his heart is at. <laughs> Just basically go on the internet and saying, I'm feeling really weak and vulnerable, and I'd like you to attack me. It's pretty much the same thing. (laughs) I'm blinking red like in a video (laughs) game box. (laughs) Some apologies are very useful, like needed, of course, but like sometimes it's like, you don't have to apologize for this shit. Now, now a bunch of like 18 year olds are just mad at you. Like, what, what are you doing? I just like the idea of like, just opening up my heart and being honest to all you anonymous racist Twitter accounts that I just want. <laughs> Let's just start the conversation, right? <laughs> Reach across the aisle. Yeah. yeah. I truly think that the superpower of people like Jesse Single is that is that they <laughs> they they don't feel any shame. And if you can't shame them, mm-hmm. they never have to apologize. So no one mm-hmm. ever tastes the blood. Yeah. Yeah. When yeah. he was on uh 
when he was on uh, Majority Report like last week, um, and <laughs> they were just like trying to get him to explain what he thinks, and he is <laughs> like, "That is, I, I mean, totally like where even to start with some with a question like that? You think I could just come on here?" And it's like, bro, it's a very <laughs> easy like, just such an open ended question. He's on the attack no matter what. If somebody's like, "Hey, how are you?" He's like, "How am I?" <laughs> How am I? That's honestly a pretty good. I way refuse to... to answer that. Also, <laughs> fuck you. Yeah. It's like a lot of what they're. Po- I listen to, to uh, their podcast every now and then just to check in, and yeah, that's as a substantial amount of their content is them just like refusing to apologize for like, just various beefs and. That's a popular that piece of content to put out. You could have a podcast called "Refusing to Apologize." <laughs> 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 You know, especially if you're like in that like centristy like transphobe space, like Jesse Single likes to occupy. Oh, it's perfect. Yeah, you're so prime for for that sort of content. I yeah. wish I knew who Jesse Single is, but oh, I, you don't know. I luckily oh, do. God know. bless you. That's yeah. I I envy you. He's he's awful. Truly he's horrible. Of, one of our many brave reporters on the gender beat, uh, mm. covering <laughs> gender and all of its forms. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah the uh, the ever important uh, high school sports beat. That the Babylon Bee <laughs> covers so intimately. Yeah, yeah. yeah, dude. yeah um, the the one thing that you put in your notes, Caleb, that I thought was funny is that like they they brag about getting fact checked, even though they're a satire website. They're ostensibly not supposed to tell the truth, but they like make satire on real things that happen about like high schools. Like, <laughs> like, well, they also like, they get, the thing is, is like, it's like a badge of pride for them to get fact checked. And this is when we get more into the, the, them, when we get into that, we'll talk yeah. about this more, but like they, it's a badge of pride for them to get fact checked, but like what they fail, like in every interview, they're like, <laughs> Snopes, the dumb libs that Snopes had to fact check us because they're so stupid. But what <laughs> they don't like mention is the fact that the reason they're getting fact checked is because their own followers think that what they write is real. <laughs> <laughs> like, that's why they're getting fact checked. Yeah. Can, can I can I admit something? When you started telling that story, I feel like. I'm a little jealous because life as simple as just being like the dumb libs and that's all it's the dumb libs at Snopes. It sounds kind of nice in its own way, right? It's like, yeah. It's, yeah. So it's a warm blanket that they can put <laughs> exactly. on at any like time. The to... woke mobs after me, the dumb libs, you know, I got, <laughs> yeah. Uh, and, I, they, and I have an anecdote to back that up too. Uh, like, so, so my, a lot of my family is conservative and, God bless them. Uh, they they listen to this podcast now. Um, so hello, Christ, my conservative family. Go. What's up, um, dogs? But <laughs> but they they visited um, where I live a couple of weeks ago, and my <clears throat> my aunt saw a Babylon Bee headline and believed it, and she, like mm-hmm. she didn't know that the Babylon Bee was like a satire website. And my uncle had to be like, "No, that's a that's a satire website." And she was like, "Oh shoot, okay." So you're you're yeah. right. Like these these people says a lot about Babylon society B. that she can't tell the difference between them. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it says a lot that she fell for it. Yeah, it's, uh, it's, uh, <laughs> and like, a, don't get me wrong. There's like a lot wrong with Snopes as like an institution. Oh, hundred percent. That runs it. So like, the guy that owns Snopes is my neighbor ish. Uh, he's Tacoma. Is he a woke lip? He's a very woke. He, he drives around in a Prius that has the Snopes logo on it. He's a he drives like an asshole. By the oh way. my god! He, what? Where do you get a Snopes sticker for your car? That's probably the custom. Website. It's a custom job, baby. Yeah, for the for the founder. He's just like you know. He's uh, they. It's not that like. He's gonna There's he's gonna debunk are. he's gonna debunk your accusation that he, he drives is. like an asshole. <laughs> yeah. Does I the founder of Snopes Prius. drive like an asshole? False. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, that motherfucker cut me off. Uh, south I five South headed towards Portland. Fuck him. <laughs> <laughs> no, but you're so right though. Like I remember in like the Bernie campaign, especially in like 2020 and 2016, like that era. There was no, so many Snopes articles talking about Bernie that were like, oh, like they they would like debunk like the dumbest shit. Mm-hmm. all the time it's like okay come on man like the, do you really have to like do like go this granular yeah. about debunking like side comments like okay well they'll also debunk like technically israel is not an apartheid state because <laughs> <laughs> oh i guess technically yeah they don't call themselves an apartheid state so technically yeah 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 there there's this thing in satire where um there's a collection of sites and parts of sites that like to basically just trick people, not 
um, exaggerate someone's negative characteristics in a way to like make a commentary about them. And when we first started the website, it was a lot of trying to distinguish ourselves. Like we've never tried to just straight up trick people, but there was like this site, I think it was called like empire something or whatever. And I remember when the whole fake news and misinformation thing started really kicking up, our site was like clumped in with these people who would just post things. It was just like Hillary Clinton dead. And then they would say, <laughs> they would say it's funny, satire. Though. It's satire. And it's like, we post it once a week, different politicians dying. And there's a big fire in your area. And it's just like, that's not, <laughs> that's not satire that's just trying to fool people which is funny i will admit i've done that in the past obviously. it's more like a prank it's more like a yeah, prank but i yeah. think it, the the truth is is more of just like they were just trying to get clicks to make a little bit of money I, one of the things yeah. that i think actually is the reason that the babylon b um manages to fool people all the time is because it's not because they're trying to pull a prank, but it's just because the humor is so flat that it's not really jokes. It just seems like they're yeah. saying they're like, people use n more pronouns. Yeah. <laughs> fucking people use all kinds of fucking pronouns. Not a joke. Yeah. It's like not a joke. It doesn't have like a setup and a punchline. So well, it I think it can be easily construed as truth because it doesn't have the format of a joke. It like doesn't right. rise to that level. It it is also a target audience of people who go to a building once a week and have people tell them that there's a magical man in the sky. So, <laughs> uh. that is, yeah, that is the prime audience. Yeah, yeah. There's like uh, the, I guess the backbone or the underlying ethos of like conservative comedy is just being it's just like aggrievement and like owning the libs and the sense of like persecution that like they're gonna make it illegal to be like a white Christian and that's. <laughs> Like, I, again, I, I, I read the entire Babylon Bee's Guide to Wokeness in the last 24 hours. Oh, I can't wait to hear about it. It is entirely like they it. The whole thing is about basically how like it's a, it's illegal and wrong to be like white and Christian. I mean, that's like 40 percent of the book and the rest of it's just like jokes like, oh, Batman gets really mad if you identify as a bat because it scares him. And it's <laughs> oh, just like, that's epic, that's dude. A le legitimately a joke <laughs> in the book. And I mean, it's just, that's, there's no, like, that's not a joke. That's not comedy. You're just like pissed. That's it. You're just pissed off. That's the joke is, 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 I, you know. Yeah. I mean, I, what, what was that? I think Matt Chrisman or someone at, at Chapo famously made, made the comment where like conservatives just try to make a joke but get too mad to finish it so well, they're just like pissed the fuck off <laughs> that makes sense yeah. yeah i actually i was thinking about that same <laughs> that same sort of philosophy around conservative comedy uh, uh, around the babylon b because they it's not that they get too mad it's that they think the joke is just saying something <laughs> it is a joke because other people might think this and it's like that it doesn't it doesn't go even it doesn't go deeper at all and it's genuinely so pathetic because they like they start with like there are men in women's bathrooms <laughs> and then the joke is just like side on the women's room says men now and it's like that's <laughs> that's not a joke there's no <laughs> information conveyed there's nothing it's yeah it's, they're just like again they're just like mad they're just mad well it's kind of like yeah. it's um it's kind of like what if there was comedy or, or it's like what if there's comedy for uh an audience of people who just get uncomfortable when anyone is different than them mm -hmm. that's like that's like the void that they fill a lot of people say oh they fill the void of being uh right-wing comedy or conservative comedy or christian comedy I think the true base <laughs> is it's comedy for people who are just uncomfortable with people who are different than them. And so that is naturally like, yeah, it's a little angry. It's a little yeah. pissed off. And it's just the joke is, you know, one of the things we started realizing on our site is um, certain articles get shared more or, or liked more. Uh, basically, when uh, it's an inside joke or a reference or whatever that allows people to identify with the content and sharing the content helps them tell you who they are. And the Babylon Bee is a perfect way to just like share it on Facebook and tell everyone that you're yeah, a it's semiotics. I mean, yeah, whatever, but it. you know, yeah. You, it's like a cultural signifier to go on Facebook uh, and share to your shithead, you know, uh, cousins or whatever, the Babylon Bee article about wokeness. Like that, just it's a way 
for you to <clears throat> yeah. tell people who you are without having to say anything besides sharing that. Yeah, yeah it's I vice mean, it's vice signaling. It's it's being <laughs> like, "Hey, here's here's the uh here's the latest article, uh, the latest hilarious article about black crime uh <laughs> that we found." You know, it's I don't know if you guys remember that. It was it was during um June. Like, you know how in in June there was like the whole Pride month. Like cuz conservatives freak out about Pride month now like again. So I I don't know if you guys remember uh the, this little thing uh called the Bud Light controversy that happened <laughs> a couple months ago and there was the uh <laughs> there was that all, there was that beer company that some like dude started that it, it was called like Ultra oh, yeah. Right mm-hmm. Beer. Yep. Yeah. Yeah, that it yeah costs- he was drinking at a Little League field. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The commercial <laughs> yeah. SWAT dingers. Yeah, yeah. And it cost. My favorite part about that was that it cost twenty dollars plus shipping to get a six pack of this beer because of but, the woke libs at UPS. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's, it's due to wokeness as always. Always due to wokeness. But I saw just yesterday, actually, just in time uh, to talk about wokeness, um, I saw a new ad from that ultra right. Uh, beer company where it was like and and this is uh talking about how it's like cultural signifier in the ad it was like this guy sitting in this room on a couch and he's like hugging this like donald trump 2024 pillow surrounded by all of these ultra right beers and it's like that that is how these right wingers will sell any of their products or comedy or anything is like they have to signify oh we love trump oh we and i mean to an extent like i guess any person who has a political ideology and will like try to to like advertise will do that but i I don't know there's there's just something so blatant about it on the right i think we could grab i think we could grab a a a small cadre of listeners if we just started saying this was an anti-woke podcast (laughs) oh absolutely Um, that we just just saying that just not changing anything about the show but just being like this is the premier anti-woke pie because people like somebody (laughs) asked me people have like you know i get insane dms and people have asked me (laughs) people have asked me stuff like is your account satire Mm. And I'm like, you think for the past five years I've posted like 50,000 times and each one of them was a deeper level of satire that I've just like, <laughs> you, you think that's more likely than I actually believe the stuff I'm saying? And he's like, well, the stuff you're saying is really stupid. And I'm like, okay, I don't I don't know where you want me to go with this conversation because I don't, like, you're not going to change my mind in my DMs by calling me stupid. I'm sorry. <laughs> I like the idea of like... uh you're like a, a grandparent at some point and your kids are asking you, your grandkids and your kids are asking you like about your life story and you go, and then I got this DM and <laughs> yeah. everything changed at that that's, moment. In retirement yeah. homes in like 50 years, that's going to be a lot of stories. Like yeah. I got this fucking DM. Yeah, that's going to be a lot of stories in the future. It had a link and I clicked on it and nothing was the same. After and it, that. It, just, it just said cuck. And I knew from that <laughs> moment my life was going to be different. Um, yeah, it was a it was a whole explainer about how Andrew Tate has said some good stuff, too. So <laughs> it's probably fine. Who's to say if he's a <laughs> trafficker or not? Who's to say if he's bad or not? Um, before we before we dive too deeply into Seth and his merry band of fools, um, did you guys see that Bill Maher is going to purposefully scab? He has he has made the conscious announcement he will be scabbing for his. I fall have season. not. Oh my god! So so Drew Barrymore and now Bill Maher are like yeah, fucked he, the WGA and shit. I mean, you know, I was genuinely surprised about uh uh about Drew Barrymore. You would think because she's like been in the union literally her entire life like she got sober from cocaine when she was 16 like she is like mm. been very mistreated by the by the industry and like has like lived this whole life her grandfather was a, a legendary producer it's uh, it's like she should know better than to do that you would think i mean yeah from what the little bit i know of her she's she actually has like a quite a compelling like life story in, uh, in yeah, like, yeah, yeah, yeah. She was yeah. going to Studio Fifty Four when she was nine years old. Her mom was like taking her, and like she was at the Oscars when she was like six, like for the first time. She's, 
yeah, she's spent her whole life in the industry. Um, but yeah, Bill Maher, uh, real time is coming back. Unfortunately, sans writers or writing, I would argue that it's always been that way. It has been five months and it is time to bring people back to work. Mm. The writers have important issues that I sympathize with and hope they are addressed to their satisfaction. But <laughs> they are not the only people with issues, problems, and concerns. Bill, what are you talking about? Nobody said that. Despite some <laughs> assistance from me, much of the staff is struggling mightily. Give them more money then, Bill. We all were hopeful this would come to an end after Labor Day, but that has come and gone, and there still seems to be nothing happening. I love my writers. I am one of them. But I'm not prepared <laughs> to lose an entire year and see so many below-the-line people suffer so much. That's why they're striking, Bill. I will wonder. I will honor the spirit of the strike by not doing a monologue or desk piece, new rules, or editorial, <laughs> the written pieces that I am so proud of on real time. And I'll say it up front to the audience. The show will be doing without my writers... Uh, will be doing without my writers. What? The show I will be doing without my writers will not be as good as our normal show. Full stop. Got it. But <laughs> it's, not as good as the, it's not as good as the regular show. <laughs> oh. <laughs> but the heart of the show is an off the cuff panel discussion that aims to cut through the bullshit and predictable partisanship that will continue. And that will continue. The show will not disappoint. So I wonder, like, yeah, he's going to have fucking Seth Dillon on to talk about how he really didn't <laughs> kidnap that 12 year old that he definitely kidnapped. By the way, this is satire. <laughs> uh, I'm only I'm only joking that Seth is a pedophile and a kidnapper. Um, get, let her out of your basement, Seth. She needs to be freed. Uh, but yeah, he's going to have Seth Dillon on to say he was canceled for uh, kidnapping a 12 year old. And um then, then Bill Maher is going to be like, I think it's cool to kidnap 12-year-olds. <laughs> and then they're going to, I guess, have like, who else would even do that? Who would do the show? Who's going to cross the picket line and go on real time? I don't even know. YouTubers? Jordan oh, Peterson? Christ. I have no yeah, clue. Yeah, he's going to have the Jake, the Paul brothers are going to come on and discuss um, discuss the war in Ukraine with, with Seth Dillon. <laughs> That's what's going to happen on the show. He should have just said, I only have a few more years left. I gotta get. I gotta get on TV. <laughs> he's got. He's got content to make. I'm old. He can't, <laughs> yeah, he can't there, keep smoking weed on his podcast and just like being the weirdest guy. Have you ever seen any fuck, of those clips? Why the fuck can't he? Why can't he keep doing that? I don't know. I don't know. Those <laughs> those clips from his like podcast or whatever he does are just always so uncomfortable and weird and just horrible. Algorithms not showing me these things. I gotta. I gotta type more stuff into the algorithm. You know. Yeah. Bad yeah. Bill Maher <laughs> podcast clips. Oh, they're horrible. Once they're you're, horrible. Once your for you page is cursed it, there's no way out like once it <laughs> once it goes down the dark path you can't turn out of it it's just like a controlled <laughs> skid into darker and darker content you don't want to do it i promise you <laughs> every Truly time it cursed. comes up i feel so good about not being a tiktok user i like tiktok i like my for you page i don't know yeah what i know talking about. I, you got I cute animal TikTok's pages awesome. or yeah I have a TikTok that makes me look like a 45 year old dad trying to keep track of his son or something like that. It's like the <laughs> username is Matt Sankum. And it's like I have 19 followers and I follow 43. No post. You know what I mean? No profile. <laughs> yeah. Picture. Yeah. Yeah. That's actually pretty close to mine. But you know what? Uh, I get nice little I get those like uh, Reddit synopsis stories where it's like the parkour Minecraft map. And mm. like uh, the music from uh, Undertale, while somebody talks about like the worst breakup of their life. <laughs> if you've ever seen those, that's pretty good. Or yeah. just like, yeah, it's little things like that. That's and, like, good content. UFO stuff and like this lady from Appalachia who talks about how ghosts are real. And I don't believe her or agree with her or even know how I found her, but she, and I don't even <laughs> follow her, but she's in my for you all the time. So good for her. Good, good app. <laughs> <laughs> Shout out to the Chinese Communist Party who <laughs> they once know, again they know how us. to waste a good couple minutes before bed. I'll say, <laughs> I'll say. Uh, do we can we talk a little bit about uh, hard times and stuff before we get into no. Babylon yeah. B? No, no, no. <laughs> that's a no secret. <laughs> that's a secret. Yeah, okay. sure. Let's, let's okay. get into it. Yeah. So you started this when you were still in college, or at least you had the idea, right? Can you tell us a little bit about like what you were going for and how it's changed? Well, there was no comedy for the right wing, brother, and I needed to <laughs> get in there. And uh, uh, I had a I had a zine as a kid, and I interviewed musicians, and I didn't know what I wanted to do uh, for the rest of my life. But 
interviewing musicians was like the only thing that I enjoyed. So I decided to become a journalist. And uh, my zine, uh, whenever I start writing things down, I stop taking it seriously and I just start making jokes. So my zine had like comedy in it. And I was learning journalism skills, like how to write a news article. And I just thought I should write comedy punk journalism for my zine. And uh, I wrote some Hard Times articles and um, I showed them to some friends. They told me that they're really stupid, that I would get beat up and that I shouldn't <laughs> do it. And uh, I didn't for maybe, I don't know, six or 12 months or something like that. And then I was uh, graduated and I was, I couldn't find a job. Eventually I became the music editor at SF Weekly. I couldn't find a job. I had some amount of free time. It wasn't stress free, free time. I had very little. Uh, money i took the amount of money that i did have and i used it to start the site and it was back in the day when uh i started with my uh my friend and co-founder bill conway and then very shortly Mm -hmm. after that my brother ed um it was back in the day when facebook algorithm like organic reach was crazy so when we started Mm -hmm. hard times we put out a joke and three million people would see it and we'd have millions of people on our website every month and all of a sudden that was worth more than my day job and that was um almost 10 years ago and i have not had a real job since oh, yeah. <laughs> uh how long after that did you get into because you also do hard drive and a couple other offshoots but that's the, the main one i think for yeah video games and stuff so um those are like my two biggest interests in life uh yeah. punk music i used to play in a band we toured the country met a lot of different people um and then video games always been a, a nerdy video game kid what was and- the band if, if you want to throw that out there i don't know if that's sure. like something yeah. you yeah what, what's the band I'm i curious. Play, I, I, played, love, I love punk i i played in a couple bands um i played in a band called zero progress i played mm-hmm. in a band called pure and i played in a band called negative choice um I, straight edge hardcore kid so that's what a lot of the names are about uh the band pure had uh two uh white guys and two uh mexican dudes or hispanic dudes and the hispanic dudes wanted to call the band pure and the white guys did not like i don't want to <laughs> play in a band called pure and they're like no yeah. the band's gonna be called pure and we're gonna have like an all white imagery meaning like literally the the color white like on the albums and stuff yeah. and i was like i really don't want to do that <laughs> um, yeah. these, these guys were like way better musicians than us and uh, they played in bands like ceremony and loma prieta and uh they won the argument so uh if you ever look <laughs> up the, the the band pure i trust trust me it's not what it looks like um, <laughs> yeah so anyways uh once hard times popped off i was like you know my other biggest interest is uh video games so we tried hard drive that popped off right away too uh and uh, that was probably six or seven years ago and we just took the best freelancers from hard times and said uh run the site and so you when go. you when you first uh, well for both of these um was there like a I feel like if I was in your position, I would have a certain level of resentment if certain jokes didn't hit and being like a niche interest thing. Are there like articles you remember putting out there that you were like, this should have fucking banged. This should have been a <laughs> fire piece and, and they don't give a shit. These, these, the swine doesn't care. <laughs> you know, I don't think so. I mean, really? I, I definitely, there's, there's articles, <laughs> there's articles that, that we think are going to do good and then they don't. <laughs> But I don't think we ever really think that the audience is wrong. We're a little more like uh, we hate ourselves a little bit more than that. Uh, <laughs> oh, I see. You know what I mean? Like we we usually go, oh, I suck. That's usually how we feel. Uh, <laughs> Turn it yeah. back on. You should consider blaming the audience. It, it feels <laughs> great. And it costs you nothing. <laughs> no, the, the audience and the customer is always right. Yeah. Of course. <laughs> the, hard times, the hard times audience has gotten much bigger but I fucking love the Hard Times audience because it's been a website, Hard Times and Hard Drive, for 10 years that has grown out of um, me picking people to run certain parts of the business and the, the comedy and me relating to those people and my topics of interest. So I find when we write jokes in the Hard Times, it's like it's all these people who have some sort of connective tissue to some of the stuff I was that I came up on, you know? Yeah. And, uh, mm. It's it's pretty fucking cool. It's pretty fucking cool to be able to make jokes about really what I feel are niche things that I didn't think anyone would care about, and then to see you know twenty thousand yeah. people read it or something. Um, 
maybe maybe I should think about a better example of uh, an article that I thought would do better. That <laughs> no, I mean, if it's, if it's how you feel, it's how you feel. So um, yeah. are you still like into, uh, I don't know where you're located, but are you still into like uh, punk hardcore? Are you still going to sh- shows and stuff? Uh, yeah, I live in Oakland. Um, I haven't gone to that many shows recently. I used to go to sure. like three shows a week and I, I went on some tours and did a bunch of stuff like that. And then I also had a job where I went to shows and reviewed mm-hmm. shows and interviewed musicians and stuff. To be frank, I'm a little, little burned out, you know? Yeah, of course. Um, <laughs> of course. So I'm not as cool as I used to be. <laughs> no, and none of us <laughs> Once are. Once you get over 30, it's over, bro. Oh, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm getting close. I, I'm, not, I'm not ready to not be cool anymore. Oh, shit. <laughs> Matt, when you were touring, did you ever make it up to the, you, I'm sure you did. Uh, did you ever make it up to the Pacific Northwest? I'm yeah, positive. yeah. We know we have to know some of the same people. We'll talk about this off air. I imagine um, that we probably do. Yeah. Uh, we you did, ever uh, do punk shows in Bremerton, Washington, or Tacoma? Tacoma for sure. Uh, the mm-hmm. other one maybe. Uh, we did a couple North American tours all across the country and into mm-hmm. Canada. Um, so like most towns or most cities that had a, a thirty plus people that wanted to like mosh in the back of a pizza place yeah. or whatever we did <laughs> exactly. Yeah, those were. I was definitely, I mean, I wasn't, um, I was like on the uh, periphery of like straight edge bands, but I would play with a lot of them and stuff, but in like hardcore bands in the scenes in Tacoma and Bremerton and stuff. So I bet we have probably ran into each other at one point. Probably. Yeah. Anyway, uh, One thing I've noticed is that the, uh, the shows are much bigger than they used to be when, I don't know if I was just, well, or maybe our band wasn't very good, but I, <laughs> I feel like I go to hardcore shows nowadays and there's like 500 to a thousand people there. And yeah. I went to, I went to a lot of shows where there was like 30 people there. Yep. And I think that I came up in a time where there was a bit like of a lull, like culturally, I came up like in like a culturally unimportant time. Mm. Um, it was like after the original punk had died out and then there was like this rebirth. And then like, there was like this little bit of a lull where like everyone was playing like 1980s style hardcore and some people cared about it, but most people didn't. And now there's like, at least in my area, it seems like there's this big rebirth with uh, like bands like Scowl and uh, Gulch and Tsunami and Drain and all these bands where it's like, I've known a lot of those guys for as long as I can remember. And I go to their show and it's like, it's like, you guys are fucking rock stars. It's crazy. It's like, <laughs> like 1,200 people here losing their minds and know every word. I There wasn't very much of that. No, I'm with you. If you were playing at like a a coffee shop that normally would have closed three hours before. And there's like 50 people there. You're killing it. That was nice. <laughs> yeah, exactly. We played in a coffee shop one time. There was just like that. And, uh, there, the stage, whatever, like the step was, yeah. uh, up, up against the wall. And then there was this big plate of, uh, glass window. Right. And the guy didn't want the show to happen. The owner, because someone had broke the glass window last time. And so there was this long discussion of like, we're not going to break the glass window. We're going to be really careful. You can trust us. Right. And I remember the promoter. And then the, the window show, was fine. Dude, the first song, the oh. first song of the first band, someone goes straight through the window out onto the oh. sidewalk of the street. God damn it. That's so and, and let me guess the venue never held uh, shows ever again. Right. I, I don't know. It was like a. Oh, man, it was in somewhere in Southern California. I wish I could think of the name of it, but probably not. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. No. Because there was a like a, a scene of like like folk punk uh, where I'm from, mm. and a, a a tattoo shop would would hold shows like yeah, really yeah. consistently, like from like 2016 to like 2018. And there was one show. Th- this tattoo shop also sold like local art. And one time, someone stole some of this like local art. Oof. And after like two years of of holding these shows, they're like, "We're never doing a show ever again here." Yeah, which really sucks. Yeah. Not worth, yeah. not worth it. Yeah, no. That's why you got to respect the space, man. I remember yeah. people always shouting that out at the mic, like "respect the space, respect the space." We're in some basement, <laughs> and then like a couple songs later, people are punching holes into the ceiling. <laughs> <laughs> It worked for about 60 seconds. When I was a kid, we used to do shows at the uh, local Unitarian church. They had like a, oh, they hell had yeah. like a rec room we could <laughs> rent for, I think, 300 bucks a night. It was really nice. Um, are, you from, then, are you from DC? I'm from Ann Arbor, Michigan. Um, okay. And, and uh, the, um, 
I'm also old. So, <laughs> uh, um, and a Unitarian. <laughs> <laughs> and um, one night my friend James was wearing a dress and there were a bunch of um, like youth crew jackasses standing outside drinking beer. And he pulled his dress up and did not have underwear on and just basically smashed his dick against a window in front of them. Um, and then they smashed <laughs> oh through the window. Uh, oh my! To to oh. attack him! And, to, to, oh my God! And uh, that was the end of shows at the Unitarian Church, and we'd had them for like <laughs> four or five years. Probably, probably the funniest guy as far as that uh, type of activity was concerned in my scene was Brace Belden, who later became fam- oh, fam- he later yeah. became famous. He always was so funny. <laughs> That he kind of seemed like he was going to be famous, yeah. um, but there was this incredible dynamic between him and his band War Crime, yeah. and uh, Nine Two Four Gilman Street and Maxim Rock and Roll. Maxim Rock and Roll was like these older punks who had were more political and more, you know, socially aware or whatever. And War Crime and the younger people were more like troublemakers, escapists or whatever. And the clash between those two groups was so funny because. The Max Rock and Roll and 94 Gilman were so serious. They would like analyze Brace's lyrics and stuff and be like, you can't play here unless you do X, Y, and Z. And then he'd like whip <laughs> his dick out. And it was like, yeah. this is like the funniest, like he was the funniest hits. I saw him throw a cinder block into the crowd one time. It's like almost like, <laughs> it, like inappropriate stuff. Like no one got hurt, you know what I mean? But there's, if anyone can find it, there's Brace got interviewed by Max Rock and Roll one time. And, uh, they were asking him like about his politics and he was explaining how there should be this strong, invisible hand that's all knowing and should control all forms of government. That should be his hand, you know, and it's like, <laughs> they couldn't get a serious answer out of him. So, yeah. Yeah. And uh, famously, if you have ever d- seen the pictures of him with the swastikas and all that stuff, that's from war crime and it's, you know, not his actual beliefs obviously <laughs> he still is to this day i see that picture pop up and he's eating shit for it which is very funny when you know the history of well i, I can i tell you something i yeah. was there not even an ounce of any it's not even like a little bit you know oh they kind of sort of almost believe it it was literally uh shock value punk stuff but also it the lyrics of the song <clears throat> i what's the i think it's called give war a chance or something like that <laughs> um, you know, it's all a joke. It's all, it's like not serious at all. So anyone who's looking back at war crime and being like, oh, Brace must be a, a bad guy. He wasn't. I was there. He wasn't a bad guy. Yeah. It, <laughs> it seems really pretty funny, obvious though. if you, yeah, it seems pretty fucking obvious if you do like 30 seconds of Googling, but you know, that's a yeah. lot to ask for people. I, these days. <laughs> yeah. I just can't believe that all these Tumblr girly type guys go after Brace occasionally just like, oh, you wore a swastika or whatever. It's like, hey bro, how many, uh, communist militias have you joined in syria motherfucker like <laughs> what <are> you, <laughs> wh- where the fuck do you get off how many breweries have you uh unionized <laughs> like what, where like he doesn't ever pull rank on those people but like it's insane that he gets accused of being like a reactionary in any way uh but, it's it's genuinely laughable but he was so funny because back in the day when he used to get accused by that he would like he would just create so many laughs by playing into it and, and yeah. just trolling them and trolling them and trolling them. He had like years of his life where you couldn't get him to say a single serious thing on the record. Yeah. The greatest <laughs> bit of all time. I have so much respect for him. He's like the funniest guy. The Andy Kaufman of like Bay Area punk. A hundred percent. A hundred percent. Yeah. <laughs> That's awesome. Um, let's see. Let's move on. I got a couple more if you don't mind before. Jeez, we're all... Over well, 50 minutes in, we haven't even gotten to the Babylon B yet. That's good. <laughs> um, it's going to be quick. It's going to be quick. <laughs> yeah, that's true. Uh, geez. Let's see. I guess my next question, as somebody who does not, I mean, don't take offenses, as, ostensibly something similar or what the Babylon B that's similar, yeah. claims to be similar. Like, what do you think the difference is between like you or Reductress or any of the other actual funny sites, obviously the onion uh, is the master splinter and you are the Ninja Turtles of this art form. (laughs) What is like the difference between some of these websites in the Babylon B like what, what different differentiates you from them? What, what makes you funny and them not? (laughs) I I would say say we we don't have a CEO whose dream in life is to kiss Elon Musk's feet. That's what seems like. Oh my God. He gets, yeah, he gets, he loves him so much. I mean, he, he bought, 
Elon Musk bought Twitter <laughs> to to restore the Babylon Bee account, basically. People right? say to people own say, his trans daughter and to uh, restore his friend <laughs> Seth Dillon. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. People, people say bootlicker. I think he's trying to take the boot off and suck those toes. I think he's really <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> the boot's uh, not enough for him. You know, there's a lot of similarities. I would say there's more similarities than there are differences in many respects. It was an independently founded satire organization. In fact, uh, I think we had a little bit to do with inspiring it. I did get an email from uh, the founder yeah, of the Babylon Bee about that. way back in the day saying hi, that he had just launched his site and he wanted uh, to open Matt Ford is his name, right? Not Seth. Adam Ford was Adam the, Ford, the email me, that yeah. I got. Um, mm -hmm. I never actually spoke to him. I looked back on the email before this podcast and I realized I actually didn't respond for a year. Uh, but after that, I did. Um, and I did offer to help him and to hang out and talk, but we never, never did. Um, but uh, so you're responsible for this. You did this. Well, you know, there was a time where I think the the algorithms were just right, where if you had a niche interest, you could start like a niche satire publication and it might be like a decent thing to do with your time. Yeah, there was like a time, yeah, where it felt like we were inundated. I feel like the the cream has risen to the top as far as um, satire news organizations I, go, other than the Babylon Bee. I think it's but, been really hard to survive, but for a while it was really yeah. easy. And so there were quite a few. Um, yeah. So, uh, yeah, I mean, one of the things I always thought, like the difference between The Onion is their every man has like a family, a house a wife two and a half kids or whatever hard times uh every man has like a roommate depression a shitty band um <laughs> i think like babylon bees like has a like <laughs> has like a youtube channel where they're like raging in yeah. their truck or whatever and yelling about <laughs> the libs to the camera um they have those reflective sunglasses too yeah yeah, yeah. i yeah, also there, every single one of their tiktok starts with well they did it again. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I would also say that they have a maybe a little bit. I you know I don't don't read very much of the Babylon Bee, but something that I've noticed is they're a little bit better business people than we are. It seems like maybe it's their maybe their um, their intentions are more business related. I remember back in the day. This is a long time ago. I don't know if they still do this. You used to have to pay to write for the Babylon Bee. Um, oh, hell yeah. Where, <laughs> wow. where I, w I was like paying my punk friends like off my credit card to write for the hard times. It's like, it's like a different, it's like yeah. a different vibe overall. Um, yeah. How do you, yeah. how do you convince people to pay you to like, how does one <laughs> do that? I vaguely uh, remember this. That was when they were doing mostly Christian stuff, right? It wasn't when they were doing the racist stuff. I don't. Honestly, yeah, I, I, I don't like I don't know so much about their trajectory, but I remember seeing it and being stunned. It was like ten dollars a yeah. month to have the opportunity to pitch us a headline or something. <laughs> That's wild. We no, need to no, incorporate like that into Western Kabuki. So if you want to like pick episode <laughs> subjects for us or come on, DM me and I'll work with you on price. If you yeah, if you're to... if you're one of the very sweet, well-meaning people who has DM'd me and you have like two hundred followers and you told me you wanted to talk about Biden's presidency or something. Um, yeah, we'll put I that in the secret feed. Well, yeah, that's in the. <laughs> <laughs> some, that's, some, something that's else. Fifty dollar a month here. I feel like when the Babylon Bee started, this is just an outside looking in thing. I feel like when the Babylon Bee started, I saw a lot of them like making fun of the hypocrisies in the church. That's and how it started. No, 100%, yeah, hundred percent. Yeah, that's something I've I found out like a year ago. Like went back to look at like the oldest Babylon Bee articles, mm -hmm. and it's like, oh, this is like well, their first a mega satire um, on. Their right. first mega viral post was uh, the Joel Osteen uh, sails his mega yacht through the flooded streets of Houston or whatever <laughs> that was. Um, yeah, that was like the first like that was like their first big millions of views type of uh, post or and, story or, or whatever. And that's kind of like we always say before you can satirize something, you have to love it, which is kind of like this is their community and the things that they're seeing that are wrong and they're investigating mm -hmm. them with comedy. I saw a decent bit of that when the Babylon Bee first was popping around. Those are the ones that were hitting me. Recently, it, it seems a little it's more changed. like Fox News E, yeah. you know, but maybe even like a Breitbart E, you know? Um, mm. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. They, they've kind of shifted into that like far right. Yeah. I, I guess what I would call it, I mean, it's uh, I would say it's a grift. Yeah. Because they know... It, they they know what makes money. You, yeah. you said it earlier. They're great businessmen. Mm -hmm. I mean that that's what the right wing has is. I mean 
great businessmen. <laughs> they know what they're doing. All right, that's it for the main feed this week. You can hear the rest of the show at patreon.com slash Western Kabuki, where you can hear us play an amazing game that Caleb came up with called Babylon B Headline or ChatGPT. Um, the results will astound you. <laughs> Again, that's uh, patreon.com slash Western Kabuki. Thanks so much. Thanks so much.